Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone for attending. I hear it said it's good to see old faces and new faces, but it's more mainly names I'm seeing up there that I, I can recognize quite a few of, and um, it's great that you're here. Today's meeting is a little bit different than our usual run of meetings in that there's no main speaker as such invited main speaker. The executive um, they'll be carrying most of the meeting and we hope you will participate um, as much as possible. I think elections, we decided on elections um, at a short notice because we had force was going to do the environment, but this, uh, because of the snap election that was called, we thought it's important for us to tackle this issue. Um, and in keeping with our ethos, as it were, that you know, we're a campaigning organization, we're an activist organization. We thought we should be linking any issues that we're dealing with, with some activism. And this is what we're doing in many ways. Um, some of the, four of the executive members actually live in Islington, um, where we have Jeremy Corbyn is campaigning as an independent, and we decided that we will back and support Jeremy um, for him to keep a hold of Islington. I uh, borrowed that he's been in charge of for the last 40 years as an MP. So we're, we're actively out there, and um, we will get a report back from one of our executive members on what's happening in Islington um, a little bit later on in, in, in the program. But I think elections are important, you know, it's a, it, and as an as a exercise of our human right. Um, and so people are, are rightly excited by elections. And it seems as though there's elections happening all over the world at the moment. Um, definitely throughout Latin America, in Africa, in Europe. Um, and it's impossible for us to really touch on all of those <laughs> election issue, but I will um, just mention a few which I think we've been involved with for some time. Um, key one, maybe I'll start with this, and, and other members from the executive will come in um, at different points when um, it makes sense for them to do so. Um, but South Africa um, is one that, from the days of the anti-apartheid movement, CLS, had always been at the forefront supporting the NC and fighting apartheid. Um, we were actually invited to South Africa for the first fair and free elections. I went with the, at the time, the president was Kirsten Taylor. We went there as observers. Um, and so we had first hand impression of what was going on and seeing the excitement of the NC being elected and people just pouring out into the streets, dancing and celebrating in the way only South Africans can do. Um, my recent trip to South Africa a um, couple of months ago, and just canvassing and talking to people really, it was very hard to find anybody who was really enthused or enthusiastic about the ANC or felt that they would win the elections. Um, there were so many issues that were in people's minds like corruption and crime, um, lack of electricity, and also um, shortages of water just before the elections in Johannesburg, um, two months before, and people were really unhappy. And it doesn't surprise me that they've lost um, an outright majority, although they did get the most votes. I know um, Ozzy, who I see was here brief briefly, might want to say something on that or comment on the, his trip to South Africa as well. And also, I had the chance to speak with you, Ozzy, but if you can maybe do any little roundup of what's happening in the Caribbean with the elections. The next major campaign, and I, I I think that's happening, and today the voting is happening, is in Mexico, um, where for the first time 
it looks as though we will have a, a, a woman leader for that country. Claudia Skeinbaum, who is hot favorite to win, and we think she will pull through. Um, and that's hugely important for the whole region because um, Mexico is one of the most populous countries in Latin America, one of the biggest economies, if not the biggest. And they're certainly of the left, which will join forces with other parties who have taken power to join Lula at the same time. Um, we also know that Venezuela is having elections soon and it is expected that the same party in power will be re-elected. Nicaragua, recent elections, doing amazing things, um, especially around women's rights, um, women's liberation, 50% women in parliament and other things. So it's very hopeful in the region in terms of where our struggles are going. But at the same time, America is also getting more active in the region and NATO seems to want to be expanding more down there. I think there's some boots on the ground in Guyana where well, there's claims that this, you know, the CIA and the Southern Command have already got bases in Guyana, um, which will add to the pressures in the region. I think Trinidad is been talking about mid, you know, also having a base in Trinidad. Um, and we know the dangers that that spell for us. America's always considered the Caribbean their backyard, as it were. Um, and we see what that can mean, especially around Grenada, who for some reason, little Grenada was seen as a threat to American existence. Um, they eventually invaded and reversed that revolution. And we know it's the, really the, the idea of a different kind of democracy from what they're experiencing is one of the threats that they feel. Um, a participatory democracy that we were experiencing in Grenada that did so much to the Grenadian people in a very short space of time um, was just a prime example of what is possible in the Caribbean that could not be tolerated by the um, imperialist forces in America. So that revolution was crushed. Um, we see in as well the polarization of the world and increasingly America is putting more and more sanctions on countries, China, Russia, breaking trade links, creating a tension really to polarize the world even more. Um, and so we need to keep an eye on what's happening around the world. And I think that's one of the reasons we've decided to have a look at um, elections and, and what that means for us. Flawed, as I, I said, you know, in some cases that it is, people have got different ideas of democracy and how it should operate. And especially in America, we see right now what's happening with um, ex-president Trump. And, you know, and their elections are coming up soon. And he's talking about nuclear war and the rest of it. So we know there are great dangers. So we have to keep an eye on the enemy. We have to keep an eye around the world and also be concerned that, you know, our leaders are actually going to be delivering for us in the Caribbean. And as we think about the elections, Haiti, one of the first countries to declare the independence in, in the black countries in the Caribbean, um, being invaded again, as it were, although seemingly invited by the United States and with Kenyan troops, to, not troops, but police, let's say a thousand police, um, supposed to be arriving anytime soon in, in Haiti. And some of our governments in the region, some of the Caribbean governments are colluding with that. And it's something we need to be thinking about and campaigning about. Um, there were some protests by Haitian Americans in the US at the Kenyan embassy objecting to 
those police going there. I needn't remind people about the brutal nature of the police force, the Kenyan police force, many of them trained by Israeli. Um, and to be used in this kind of a way, really, to more or less as mercenaries, because America is paying for them to go to Haiti, and we need more opposition from the region. Um, we need true fair elections in Haiti, and not you no know, sham elections, which, you know, there, there's no elected government there at the moment. So the elections that are free and fair might be able to restore some kind of um, hope to the people um, in Haiti at the moment. I'll just stop there for now, and I hope that you know people will have the questions and we can have a, a, a discussion really about elections on the whole. But um, for now, the whole issue of elections in the, the UK was clouded by the way Jeremy Corbyn was treated, the way Diane Abbott was treated, and now Shamina. And I'll ask Steve to maybe update us a little bit on what the situation with um, Jamila at this point. Okay. Uh, Steve? If you can hear me, just a couple of points before yes. before I do that. Just to say that uh, our comrades down in Dorset have just got hold of me to ask for 100 copies of the CLS pamphlet on Drax as they're campaigning uh, in Dorset for no vote for Drax. Uh, they're not actually saying who people should vote for, as long as they don't vote for him, uh, which I think is a, 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 an important position. Uh, there are quite a number of independent uh, socialist candidates standing. Uh, I know about London. There'll be loads outside London that we don't know about, but that we'll start to get the details on. Uh, but if I can just uh, mention very briefly... Uh, round my way in North East London, uh, uh, well, no, in North London, because uh, there's Leanne Mohammed in uh, uh, Ilford North, uh, a uh, British Palestinian, uh, Palestinian British, whichever way you want to look at it, a uh, woman who is campaigning not only on the question of Palestine, but on the question of loads of kind of working class issues uh, that are happening there. Uh, there's Pamela Fitzpatrick in Harrow West, uh, that our comrades in the area. Are, support, is, uh, are supporting. And of course, there's Andrew Feinstein talking of the ANC. Andrew Feinstein was a uh, an ANC uh, member of parliament and a member of the first uh, uh, ANC government in South Africa. Well, he's standing in, in Camden against Keir Starmer. Uh, so that could, be, uh, that could be very interesting. But what I really want to talk about is there's been a purge. Uh, the Labour Party has done a kind of internal coup and one of the people that's been affected is Faiza Shaheen, who was the prospective uh, Labour uh, 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 Labour candidate for Chingford and uh, Wanstead. She was she was well set to win. Uh, she's uh, I was interesting. She's born locally, uh, working class woman, son, a uh, daughter rather of uh, 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 immigrants from South Asia. Uh, and uh, 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 and the whole sudden sucking of her is uh, it reeks to me of racism, misogyny, uh, anti-working class, anti-socialist. Uh, it reminds me of uh, uh, John Lennon's song, "The Working Class Hero," where they say they hate you if you're clever and they despise a fool. Well, she's no fool. She's actually you know, from that background she is now a professor uh, at uh, uh, London School of Economics uh, but uh, campaigning on the basis that we don't want to have individuals rising above their community we want the whole community to rise together well that doesn't fit in with the current kind of Labour policies so they sat to her at the last minute and they've replaced her with a woman called Sharma Tatler from uh, who's uh, Cabinet Member for Regeneration in uh, Brent. Uh, she's known locally as Tower Block Tatler because she has built, uh, uh, she's so favoured the developers. Uh, she's, you know, built, uh, arranged for the building and permitted the building of high rises 
people say she's ruined South Kilburn. So uh, uh, it's quite interesting that a woman who has said that she uh, 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 that the green belt contains many places that aren't green and aren't pleasant and need to be developed uh, 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 on a constituency that surrounds Epping Forest, uh, I think is uh, uh, is a disgrace. But the people of the area, are, I went to them, uh, they announced on Thursday uh, that uh, Faiza had been uh, uh, had been sacked. By, wo by word of mouth only, there were three or four hundred people uh, in the square in Himes Park Friday evening uh, for an impromptu rally. Uh, we don't know whether she's going to stand. Uh, she did say, because uh, it'd be a difficult decision, because I mean, she just had a baby, there's lots of... Uh, yeah, the pressure would be enormous. But she did say they haven't heard the last of me. I've got some difficult decisions to take. We are hoping she will stand. And if she does, uh, uh, I think that's one of the candidates that we should do all we can to get elected. So uh, I'll, uh, uh, I think, rant yes. over. Uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, but uh, all, uh, yeah, the... all I'll say is that, 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 that people around here are very, very angry about what, what Starmer and his cronies have done. Yes, thank thank you very much for that, Steve. I think what what what, what I think I'll do is um I'll just ask Nadine to come in now and um and then we'll just take a break for people to put questions and some discussion on those, and then um there's some other executive members will actually do doing some other reporting back. So um thank you, Steve and Nadine. If you want to take the floor, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um. As people may know, um, I'm a Labour Party member in Islington North, which is Jeremy's constituency. Um, we are standing him as an independent. Um, some of us stayed in the party to fight a kind of rearguard action. And there's lots of Labour councillors who we're working with who were very, very upset about the position this has put them in. Um, the Labour Party appointee is called Prafal Nagund. He's um, a Hindu, probably Modi supporter, um, who has absolutely no connections with listening to North. He's an Islington South councillor who doesn't even really go to meetings. I think he only really became a councillor to become an MP. The As Luke, Luke's been out with our campaign, um, we're getting pretty good early support for Jeremy. Um, but going to back what Steve said about Fazia, it is a huge undertaking to run an independent. And we've actually been working at this for about a year and we are struggling with an, all the legal and financial um, difficulties of running um, an independent MP when you don't have a party behind you. So that's going to be a real problem for some of the um, independents who I think will make a good showing. But um, when you're independent, you have a very small budget, um, whereas the Labour Party can lose lots of um, spending in their own spending, um, and they have a machine. So we're starting from ground zero. It is going very well. We've got a lot of very enthusiastic volunteers, uh, both, I'd say, about 50% older and 50% young. Um, and we're just at the beginning. We leave it probably the whole borough the whole constituency last week and we've done a lot of canvassing this weekend but it's going to be we're very organized but it's going to be a challenge because it's hard for independence to win under any circumstances um but anybody who wants to come and help just let me know we've got people coming in from all over the place and the more people who come in with um campaigning experience the better because some of the young people really don't have much experience. They've got loads of enthusiasm, but they have practically no experience on the ground. And it's very noticeable. They're used to doing lots of work online, but they are quite nervous on offline. <laughs> so anybody, Luke's already doing some work. Anybody else who wants to come, you're all very welcome. And I can answer any questions. Thanks. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that, Nadine. I mean, the, the question I, 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 I would ask is, um, leading up to the actually um, this electing or just parachuting in somebody, what was the, the feeling on the ground in the Labour Party 
in Islington and how was that really taken? Well, Islington North and made us, we are quite an organised party and we had on the whole decided to stay and invite them. Um, not with any expectation that, that we could get a candidate we wanted because they obviously were never wanting to. The decision was made politically to um, agree to go into the system they set up, which was an online hustings, an online um, selection. Um, but they would, the party would choose the shortlist. So for propaganda reasons, we decided to go ahead with that so we could have more information when we criticise their, their position. Um, in effect, they cancelled that um, without any notice. So that we knew from Twitter they'd cancelled it and they'd chosen Prapple. A good three days for anybody who's on the uh, general management committee knew. Uh, we were told at midnight three days later that Prapple was our candidate. People, it's fair to say the vast majority of members are really angry. And even members who I wasn't sure whether they would support Jeremy as an independent are now supporting him. And he was out in my very local area where I'm still the ward chair this morning. And I've had loads of people send me pictures of his poster and some of the things that were said are not repeatable. <laughs> um, and he isn't getting any local people. He's putting up lots of photos and Twitter, but when you look at them, they're either regional officials or right wingers from other places. He's getting virtually no traction from the Labour Party. He's not even really calling himself the Labour Party candidate in a kind of way, because I got a letter from his self appointed agent who said, I am now the election agent for Arsenal Wards for Praffles campaign. So it's not even clear to me that they're running a, a real Labour Party campaign because they can't get the Labour Party to cooperate. Therefore, they're running this odd campaign. Um, and I think they're going to make legal and financial mistakes, is all I can say. Okay. And, which should be good. Yeah, yeah. They, they, this should, should certainly must be a very good, bad showing for democracy and, you know, the so-called democracy that we're living in. That, you know, as locals, we're not allowed to choose who we want to represent us. Um, yeah. Okay, we've got a question. Uh, one hand is up. Um, Ola, how are you doing? Do you want to come in? I'm you doing well, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know a very quick question. What are the costs at the moment for running as an independent? Do we know? You mean the limits? That's a real problem. We have the, we have not the so money. Much, sorry, not so much limits as in, you know, the, the, obviously the larger your constituency, then you could go all over the place in terms of what you actually want to say and register with various people. I'm looking at more in terms of what are the actual costs registering. Think, oh, no. The, the, Jeremy can register as the, the um, candidate. For us, that isn't the problem. But as an independent, your your cost limit is incredibly low. I think it's like, I'm I'm, I'm not very good at figures. It could be twenty five thousand. Say, I don't think it is. It's between twenty five and I think it's about twenty five thousand. That doesn't go very far. So we have more offers of money than we can take, and we have offers in kind, but we have to account for those to the electoral commission. So, um. We are very, we're, we're rich on people, but short on materials because we have to rigidly keep to the um, spending limits. And that's the problem. Um, we've been had donations for trade unions and quite big donation of individuals, but that's ironically not the problem. The problem is that we can only, uh, we're only legally allowed to spend so much. Okay, but just in case, uh, um, I'm sure maybe I've not answered the, asked the question in a way that is clear. What is the actual cost of registering as an independent? I can look it up. I don't think it's hardly anything. The registering okay. is not the problem. But it's, but then you have to you have to have some kind of office in your constituency, and you obviously have to have some kind of the cost of materials um, that all adds up, and you. 
we don't have many paid staff. We do have lots of volunteers, but we do have a couple of part-time staff. Um, let me whilst whilst you're talking, I'll look up. I'll look up the what the cost of register. I think it's negligible the cost of actually registering. Dean, it's in the chat. In the chat, um, oh, Ellie's put in and five hundred pounds deposit. Okay. Thank you very much. But we've got more than enough, but it's just that we. We have to be careful what we do spend, otherwise he gets taken. And we, he doesn't win. <laughs> that ironic. Sorry, I disappeared for a moment to answer the door. <laughs> um, right, and it wasn't a, um, a, a somebody well, campaigning. Can I? Uh, I can step in you. there to say that um, Tusk has said to register as one of their candidates, which you could have done up until yesterday. Um, it'll be 1500 which includes the yeah, registration fee and 50,000 um, leaflets to go along with the Tusk, uh, with the Tusk logo. I don't know if that would help you. Okay. Oh, okay. Frank, Frank, thank, thanks for that. Maybe now might be a good time for you to, to tell us a little bit more Have about the um, Tusk. Uh, you huh? finished the question in, have you? Okay. I, I, okay. I thought you just answered this one with, with Ola, yes? Yeah, Ola, I just was, answered. Was your question answered it? Great, thanks. And it's going to be something in the in the chat as well for you. Okay, um, Frank? Yeah, well, okay. Um, First of all... Um, yeah, if you... Yeah. Tusk, Trade Union and Socialist Coalition. Um, this is heavily um, backed by um, the, the unions, especially the RMT. Tusk... Um, their basic policy is will oppose cuts to council jobs, services, pays and pay and condition, reject increases in council tax, rent and services services charge to uh, compensate government cuts. And they will vote against privatization of council jobs and services, etc. Basically, it's trying to be the, the party of the working class, which um, was the, the position held by Labour at some stage years ago. But, um, you know, we tried to bring it back to, to that. Um, like I said, I know it basically from the RMT's uh, uh, perspective of uh, Tusk. Um, it was started, or it was one of the co-founders was uh, Bob Crow, um, and uh, you know he he got the RMT fully behind him, behind um, Tusk. Um, well, since his death, um, which was in twenty fourteen, we've seen um, an a a a, a basic um, side shifting. They're trying to pull the RMT back into the Labour Party or support for the Labour Party. Uh, we've had several meetings which, um, uh, um, you know, don't forget the, um, the um, RMT was um, expelled from the, the lab from the Labour Party quite some time ago. Um, we, we um, so far we had prompted, well, since Jeremy's um, DC election, um, which was in, um, was it March last year? Yeah, we have had a, a, general, uh, a, a general meeting, AGM, which um, basically um, preempted this early election and also made it, um, made it so that RMT would back Jeremy in um in his decision if he decided you know back him to stay in the Labour Party or back him as an independent. So um as far as an AG AGM as for RMT is concerned, we are totally backing right. uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Again, that wasn't that is the members mm -hmm. uh um okay, okay. angle yeah. on it. Good, good. Are you saying something yet, um, Luke? Oh, sorry, I was just um, answering the phone to um, an executive member. 
Um, yes, but I, but I heard, heard what you're saying, your decision to, yeah. um, RMT's decision over back in Germany, yeah. and I think that's a fantastic. What I wasn't clear about, um, I don't know if you remember, what was the reason for RMT being expelled from the, 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 the TUC? What was happening there? Well, we... we from we were, the Labour Party. Yeah, we were expelled from the Labour Party because uh, we um, supported um, candidates from other parties who were pro-workers. Like the Green Party, we would um, support, um, you know, uh, members. It was us, up to us to support mm -hmm. who we wanted to support, not just a blanket yeah. support of the Labour Party that at that time under Tony Blair was not doing anything for the, who you know, as we saw it, they weren't doing anything to stop the anti-trade union laws that was being that was being brought up, brought up by the Labour Party itself, you know. And the ones that were there before by Maggie, they, they weren't trying to to um to to get rid of those, repeal those. So it's that was the reason we fell out with the Labour Party, and that's why we were expelled. We was expelled by Tony Blair and his cronies at that time. Okay. Yeah, but so um, not not a bad thing. Yeah, nothing. I said not a bad thing to to be. Standing up for this, so, so thank, thanks, thanks, thanks for that explanation. I've got a question, Leah. You want to come in? Take the floor. Thanks unmute. so much, Lou. Um, yeah, this is all really very interesting. I'm, I'm wondering. So I'm interested, like the the, the comrade from Islington North, because of course backing Jeremy will mean expulsion. Um, I'm sure many people don't care, but I'm I'm just aware aware of that, and interested in how people will handle that and will they wait to be expelled or will they resign? I mean, many people are resigned in um, uh, Pfizer, Shaheen's constituency, I know. Um, but I'm interested from um, the comrade who just spoke, uh, Frank, I think it was, and others. Um, I, are we linking, you know, there's these various movements for the many and the collective. Well, I think the collective might be like grouping them all together so that those who are standing in opposition to Labour candidates are are working together to sort of not trip over each other. So I'm interested to know how that's working out. Also, while I've got the floor, just really sorry, I've not been able to make meetings for a while. You don't need to, my excuses, but I am disappointed and glad I could be here today. Um, and thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank, thank, far, thanks for your question. Yeah, as far as Tusk is concerned, they will only um, feel candidates in areas where there is, there is no um, left wing, uh, or oh, referring that we recognize as such um, candidates, you know, um, against the Labour Party, yeah. Um, but other parties, we've got like uh, Shaheen, we wouldn't have stood, Jeremy, um, Galloway, those people who are, you know, considered left, we will not go in, we will not field our candidates in their areas. So it is a kind of uh, support for each other, but. Um, you know, we want to make that more permanent, you know. Yeah, yes. Th thanks, Frank. I'm sure there's plenty of room for that and likely to happen down the road. Mm -hmm. um, I've got next in line, uh, but I'm not sure if it's Cody and Nadine coming. Leah, yes, your I hand is still up. Do you want it to be up? Yeah, Sorry, it was, it, was sort of an, it, it, was a, it was another question, but maybe related, which is which I think maybe we discuss it a little later in the meeting, because I, I see it rather unlikely that most people, maybe Jeremy, I think Jeremy should get elected, but it's about part of building the movement. You know, this is this is sort of putting a mark on stand for the movement for a future alternative party and all sense of society come to that, but also um, to be really preparing to oppose a Starmer led government. It seems to me that's sort of where I'm looking. Uh, in a way, so uh, I forgot to say that before. And thanks for letting me back, Luke. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, Leah. I'm sorry, um, Nadine. I was going to re reply to Leah's question. Um, Islington North is is probably slightly different since we've survived when lots of other left parties haven't survived, and the party on the whole was quite disciplined. Um, there has been a debate about whether people should resign or they should stay in the party till they're expelled. I actually don't personally believe that 
it makes much difference in North. So people resign in Islington North or known to be Jeremy supporters, I don't think they're getting back into the party anytime soon. I know if you're expelled, you'll be have an auto exclusion. And there has been a debate, but we've taken it more tactically. Some of us have stayed in until they expel us, which has proved to be very useful because it's meant we've been able to organise amongst Labour Party members and an increasing amount of Labour Party middle ground people have come over to Jeremy in the last three or four weeks. Um, there, I'm the chair of a ward and there is only one active member in a very active ward who is now with Prapple. The other thing is we, we have a good Labour Council who builds houses, who's very good with disabilities, who's very good, was one of the first people to do free school meals. So we are also where we need to try and protect the Labour councillors as soon as, as long as we can. And we've told the Labour councillors who are on the left not to resign. Um, and I've been liaising a bit with the Chief Whip to see whether we can do the least damage possible. We don't want to lose the left councillors without repercussions for public services. So it's a bit of a, a tricky thing. I I don't anticipate I'll be in much longer because I just signed Jeremy's nomination paper yesterday. So. I think it's likely they'll come looking for me. But at the moment, I'm still trying to take as many people out of the Labour Party as I can. And, and it's easier if you're actually in the Labour Party. But, um, and I, Lee, I don't think it makes a difference. People who resign now, they're not going to get back in anytime soon. Yeah. Good. Thank, thank, thanks for that clarification, um, Nadine. We've got Steve up. Just to say, uh, rather amusingly, I've just looked at the Chingford and Woodford Green Labour Party website, uh, which has not yet been changed and still says our candidate is uh, uh, Dr. Faiza Shaheen. Uh, so, uh, 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 I, and, uh, 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 so I wonder if, uh, uh, you know, that the, the, uh, they're waiting to be they're waiting to be pulled down from their website rather than anything else so that that just rather amused me i think you know there's uh, uh uh there's still there's still you know sort of uh because i think phase if she stands i think she can win uh if uh, uh with a bit of work uh i know it's difficult uh and, and yeah there's the spending limits uh there's no big machine but there's a lot of in a locality where a lot of people are really fed up uh, uh with both the, the current conservative government and with the alternative you know i mean uh uh it it reminds me of when i was a teenage maoist i used to chant labor tory both the same well uh i'm wondering how I'd maybe right all along so uh i think that's uh, uh there's a lot of people uh, around who are just so fed up that i think she stands a very good chance but it, we'll see if she does Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you, Steve. I think this is a good time for me to bring in um, Fabina. Are yeah. you ready? Because, you know, we, I, I think you did a little updated to us at the last meeting about what was happening with um, Diana, but okay. there's a story now. Okay. Can Can you hear me? Am I coming through clearly? Yeah. Very clear. Okay. I'll be, uh, I hope to be brief, uh, um, but I'll give Diane Abbott's case um, not the case of her reinstatement as a member of the Parliamentary Labour Party, but her case in relation to how we appear to have arrived here. You will recall, comrades, that Diane Abbott was the first black woman MP elected to the UK Parliament. She was elected in 1987. She was elected for Hackney. North and Stoke Newington, uh, which is the borough coincidentally adjacent to Jeremy's, I understand. Now, she has been a long standing critic of Israel and has um, sided with the Palestinian people against the injustices they are facing at the hands of uh, that state. In 2021, um, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance issued a statement defining what anti-Semitism was. 
the statement um, contains a number of things, um, some of which I think are fairly unusual. Most of it are things that I would agree with, but if you'll allow me, I'll read some of the things which seems a little bit uh, concerning. Um, <clears throat> Article 5, it says, accusing Jewish people, Jews as a people, or Israel as a state of inventing or exaggerating the, the Holocaust. Um, I think there is some debate there. I'm not a Holocaust denier, and neither is CLS. Um, but there is a case of when Israel exaggerates the Holocaust. Article 7, denying Jewish people their right to self-determination. For example, by claiming that the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor. Well, I think a number of people would consider the state of Israel to be a racist endeavor, but that's not for our debating now. And Article 10, drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. Again, that's subject to a degree of debate. Why am I saying this? <clears throat> because I was at the time a member of the Labour Party, and the Labour Party adopted the um, IHRA um, definition of anti-Semitism wholeheartedly. Um, at the time, a number of people in the Labour Party saw this not as an attempt to make the Labour Party um, free of racism, but rather as a crude attempt to elude with uh, um, those who supported uh, the State of Israel and those who were hostile to the left in the Labour Party to have a common platform from which they could attack those on the left. Now, in April uh, 2023, Diane wrote a letter, and it was a letter um, in response to an earlier article in The Guardian by uh, Tawiya Owaladi, um, in which he claims that uh, Irish, Jewish, and traveler people all suffer from racism. She responded, it is true that many types of white people with points of differences, such as redheads, can experience this prejudice, but they are not all their lives subject to racism. In pre-civil rights America, Irish people, Jewish people, and travelers were not required to sit at the back of the bus. In apartheid South Africa, these groups were allowed to vote and at the height of slavery, there were no, no white-seeming people manacled to the slave ships. Um, the, the, the roof fell in on Diane. Uh, she was accused of uh, anti-Semitism, anti-traveler uh, discrimination, and anti-Irish discrimination. Um, she was, some would say she was forced, um, but she uh, apologized for her letter and had been suspended as a result of this letter. And apparently her case went through the Labour Party machinery and she was cleared to rejoin um, the Labour Party sometime in December of last year. And uh, it appears that the leadership of the Labour Party had been dancing left to right as to whether uh, she should be allowed in. As a result, she was, um, kept in a state of purgatory and it's uh remind me of the walter scott poem the labor party leadership's role is uh you know um that uh you first of all practice to deceive uh when you said about lying now <clears throat> it was reported earlier this year that a leading supplier to the national health service a gentleman called Frank Hester had stated in 2019 that he hated Diane Abbott when he saw her on television. He developed a hatred for all black women and for her in particular, that in fact, what he wanted was for her to be shot. Now, this was too much and Around March of this year, when the news came out, we took action as CLS. And one of the things that we did was we wrote a series of letters um, to 
a number of individuals and organizations calling out Hester's um, actions. And the letters are broadly in this vein. Uh, we would write to the individual. In this case, um, a letter was written to Sir Lindsay Hoyle, who is the Speaker of the House of Commons. And we reported on Hester's comments, which were, you just want to hate all black women because she's there. And we went on to say, as you know, it has been further reported that he also remarked at a 2019 meeting at his company, the Phoenix Partnership, that he wishes for her to be shot. This comment was made subsequent to the assassination of Joe Cox, MP for Battley and Spen. Um, we informed Sir Lindsay that we we're extremely concerned about the remarks, the effect that they had on Miss Abbott, and the mood that it creates for non-white persons in the United Kingdom. We also um, reminded him of a Sky News report in which he stated following an amended SNP motion on Gaza, where, as you know, he played a role in preventing the motion from going forward, that he did so in the best interest of members and their safety, because he never wanted to pick up the phone to find a friend had been murdered. The report went on to say that he had meetings with the police about threats posed to, the MP, posed to MPs and I am guilty because I have a duty of care that I will carry out to protect people. And letters like this were sent to, amongst others, um, Sir Keir Starmer, Sir Mark Rowley, uh, Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. Um, we also wrote to the Electoral Commission. We also wrote to the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And we wrote to Diane herself, expressing our support for her and to supporters of Diane expressing our support for her. We also wrote to the High Commission for Malaysia, uh, Malaya, did I say Malaysia? Uh, Malaya, Malaysia, and um, the High Commission for Jamaica, because it appears that Hester is seeking to expand his company's interest into those countries. We also, uh, I also individually, uh, reported the matter to the West Yorkshire Police as a hate crime and it appears that a number of people had beaten me to it and so they are mounting a contest a an investigation into the situation faced by diane in relation to these comments so we've done a fair amount it goes without saying that no one has responded um so mark rowley no um lindsay hoyle no a kiss drama no Maybe he's still thinking about it and so on. And so we have this situation where this MP, whatever you may think of her views, has been the subject, and even Starmer accepts this, as being the most vilified, vilified MP in the House of Commons. She is the um, lead motif, if you like, of all of the racist hatred and misogynistic hatred that people have. And this is a hatred that allows you to be racist because you can criticize Diane and say, I'm not being racist, I just disagree with her views. No, you don't. You are being racist and she is a woman who has been serving this country for over 40 years. And this is how she's been treated without anyone coming to her defense. Well, CLS, has come to her defense. In closing, um, we've agreed to follow up with a letter calling for um, these organizations and individuals to tell us what they have done and what action they are taking. Um, I'm at fault here because I haven't sent it out. I hope to send it out now that I realize I haven't sent it out. Uh, I hope to send it out in the next few days. Um, if you have any questions, I'm welcome to answer your questions. Um, I hope to have to report more fruitfully in the future. Yes. Uh, if you want copies of the letters so that you can make your own letter and send it off to whoever you may wish, um, please feel free to contact me um, through CLS. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Rabina, you know, for, for the work you've put in and keeping this issue alive as it were um diane still needs a lot of support 
she will still continue to need support even if she gets elected. Um, so we will keep up the our interest in this. So th thanks for bringing that mm -hmm. to us. We've got one question, one hand up, um, Shahib, and then Nadeed. So in that order. Hi, good Thank afternoon, you. comrades. Good afternoon. Um, uh, Shweb Malik, I'm a RMT member uh, over here in Liverpool. Um, comrade just uh, touched on the I I IHRA definition of anti-Semitism and just to make you all away, at our National Black Ethnic Minority Advisory Committee conference in March this year, yeah, uh, I myself put forward a motion which was accepted by the conference asking the RMT to reject the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism because uh, the way that we see it is that that definition in itself is racist and anti-Semitic. It excludes all the uh, indigenous Semites from there, and it's only for the benefit of Zionism. And uh, just want to make you aware that last year also, I think the United Nations had a motion tabled by roughly about over a hundred organizations, which included. Israeli Betzalem, uh asking for the United Nations not to adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism as well. And because once you read into it, you can see that uh, who, we, who we actually benefits. It benefits the elites, the Zionists, the capitalists in power, basically, to keep their agenda going. And uh, just wanted to say that if that anything can be done with regards to that, I mean, I've just been made aware now that uh, the Labour Party has actually uh, is supporting it. But uh, if Diane does stand as Labour candidate, I'm just wondering what her position would be on the IHRA definition, and if she was to if she was to oppose it, would she be expelled again? I'm not saying that she will, Good. because I don't know. I mean, what her position is on on uh, on it, but uh, that's the position that we've uh, as be back uh, advised the last conference from our conference to the RMT to reject the uh, definition and to work towards uh, working with other other trade unions, also with the rejecting it as well. Thank you. Great. That Thank, thank you for that, sir. I see, Dennis, Rabina, you want to yes, respond? Yes, um, now, it may seem strange that I've linked the State of Israel and the various organizations that, that can be perceived as supportive of the State of Israel to Diane. But you will need to only look over the news in the last few months that the use of the anti-Semitism has been um, utilized by the Labour Party to get rid of people they don't like, including right-wingers. And this is no coincidence that Diane is facing this criticism. Um, anything that, if she had mentioned, probably if she had not mentioned Jewish people in her response to the article then maybe she could have scraped through they would have probably found something else so maybe that's a bit moot but this is something that's pointed at diane and why because she along with jeremy and along with others are supportive of palestinian people and so she is subject to this ferocious attack i'm not saying that it's been coordinated by the various government agencies in Israel. I am not saying that at all. But it is strange that the Labour Party is purging people who have a view that is harmful to the current uh, Zionist um, exercise in Israel. Now, I am not saying that Hester has linked in with this. I think he's like um, the hounds that follow the fox. 
he's just piling in. Um, he has been energized in a negative way by the various criticism that's been mounted on Diane and his piling in. But behind of all of this, behind the suspension of Diane, is the need to protect Israel in its current behavior. Good. Thank, thanks. Um, Nadine? Hi. Um, then I don't know how much you've actually talked to Diane and Diane's people recently, but she, as I understand, the position is that she has been cleared to stand in Hackney North if she wishes mm -hmm. to do so. But it's not clear yet whether she does wish to do so, because mm -hmm. as some people know, she's not very well. Um, and Jackie McKenzie, who's a close friend of um, hers, might know more. The other problem Diane's going to face is that she has a lot of local support, but in the meantime, to the left of lost all but one ward in um, Hattie North. I actually spoke to the chair of that ward yesterday. It's going to be likely that the right wing in Hattie North Labour Party won't support her, and she's going to have quite a hard time even as a Labour Party candidate. So it's up to her to decide whether she really thinks mm -hmm. in her present health she can do that or not. Yeah. Um, Diane, I think, was a bit too busy to, or her staff was certainly a bit too busy to to respond. I did reach out to them a couple of times, um, but I didn't uh, suspect. And you can almost see it. It's, um, you know, it's a case of this is what they're going to do. What? Why should we expect them to do any better? So they will say, of course, she can stand. Um, all of that stuff is all over. Bygones will be bygones. Oh dear, she's not been selected by the party in a democratic way. And, you know, too bad. And to a certain extent, that is the nature of politics. She, she has yeah. been selected. She is the yeah. candidate. Oh, the, apologies. Ap apologies. She I thought months she... ago. Oh, no, she's, she's been selected as a candidate months ago. Then they told her because she was suspended, she they didn't know. And then she said, when they reinstalled the whip to her, they said, but she couldn't be the candidate. Now they said she can be the candidate if she wants. So right. it's very much whether she herself mm -hmm. has got the health. And it's, mm -hmm. it's going to be grueling for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she looked pretty ill okay. at the yeah. event in Hackney. Yeah. Oh, again, okay, thanks, oh, thanks. with a complex web thanks. we weave. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't, know, I didn't know those things. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank, thanks for updating all there. We've got Ola, you wanted to comment? Come in. Yeah, it is a, a comment up. stroke question. Um, and basically, you know, as much as we look at the situation with Diane, um, there in the, within the black community, there are um, discussions that are going on where we're actually asking ourselves, well, what is it all about? What is the point? What is the use? You know, we understand, and, and most um, black people living in this country have gone through some type of similar type of situation, whether we've been, you know, whether it's our family members or, or ourselves, we've either been overlooked for promotion or, or not put into a, into a position that we ought to get all of these type of things in some way yeah. or another. And so, you know, there, there is a question in terms of what is it that we're actually doing when we vote for Labour or we run for um, um, position in this, in this country? And, you know, it's not, I'm not saying this or putting this as a, some kind of, um, oh, we shouldn't be involved in politics. I think what I'm trying to express is that there has to be some way of widening the scope of what we're doing when we call ourselves activists that go into parliament. Simply, and I'm simply saying this on the basis that I, for, for us looking as Africans, I'm a Pan-Africanist, my major issue is that it's almost as though there's no link 
to masses of people that have some kind of um, outlook with regards to um, all Africans and, and seeing themselves past just being um, people living in this country. There, there must be some yeah. way that we actually give some kind of larger scope or, or, or outlook to what we're doing. Because other than that, when yeah. what happens to Diane happens, there's a simply a way that others would turn around and say, "What do you expect? <laughs> you lie down with you lie down with dogs, you get fleas, you know." And I, I don't want yeah. to okay. be disrespectful, but you know what is a overall agenda? Yeah, I, I think um, you know there there's some that go into parliament like Barney Grant and others who certainly made the waves for for black people and and, and other people. I think um, we've got. Two hands up, three hand, two hands at the moment. Um, I'm not sure which one went up first. I'm seeing an actual hand up there, but um, I'll 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 go to Leah first because she's next in line. Leah, so after Leah, David, you'll come in. Leah, thank you, Luke. Um, I I I just wanted to say I'm I've so I put a few bits in the chat. I'm I'm from Jewish Voice for Labour. Um, so a bit like you, I guess, having the word Labour is becoming a bit of an embarrassment. But um, we are, unfortunately, this sort of amongst the world's experts on the IHRA. So do come to us if you want any help. There's just masses of work that's been done by us and by others. And we are linked to Jewish groups across the globe who are come together basically to fight um, the uh, prevalence of the IHRA definition. So I just wanted people to know that. In relation specifically to Diane Abbott, I mean, there is always this question about left-wingers staying in the Labour Party. And I think, um, sorry, the, the comrade from Islington North saying, you know, trying to hang on to the left councillors that you've got. And this dilemma all the time when we're in this two-party system, which we're going to have to work very, very hard to break, of what do people do? And yes, lying down with dogs, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, But... Um, Anyway, my understanding about Diane Abbott, I found it quite equivocating of Starmer, which is hardly surprising, that he didn't say, um, yes, she has the whip. Of course, she's, um, you know, she's misunderstood that, you know, I don't know where she got the idea that she was barred from standing. She's got the whip back. So, of course, she is the candidate. She said she's free to stand. He said she's free to stand. And I didn't get from that, that she was therefore the candidate in Hackney North and Stoke New England, but that it would go to the NEC. Now, I may be wrong, but no one's cleared that up um, from the leadership uh, end to say, of course, if she wishes to be, she is the candidate. Um, so a lot of us are left a bit up that what she said at the rally, and I certainly saw that she didn't look very well, was that I will be your MP. So at the rally, at least, it sounded as if she wanted to, to stand. Um, anyway, I just put that that out there that not yes. not to have it answered particularly, but that confusion is yeah. is out there amongst the activists. Meanwhile, people like Luke Aithurst, um, whoever's replacing Shaheen um, uh, Pfizer Shaheen, and whoever's replaced Lloyd Russell Moyle, these have all been selected without having to go to the NEC somehow. So the double standards mm. is screaming at people, and anyone who cares, you know, I, you know, I'm 70 now, but I still often feel like a child, you know, stamping my foot, going, "It's not fair," and I'm quite glad not to have lost that either, because it's not fair for me. Or because I can see, I mean, I'm a white woman, obviously, I can see the blatant unfairness of how black people are treated and 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 many other examples of unfairness. And I don't want to lose that. But the it's so it's so in your face that the, the double standards, you know, around uh, what Diane Abbott said, um um Quabina outlined that very, very carefully. Um, compared to you know the fact that Steve Reed said something much worse. In my opinion, I think Diane's um, way of expressing it was a bit clumsy in that letter, but I certainly didn't see anything anti-Semitic. And if it was anti-Semitic, why was it not also anti-Irish or anti-traveller? Why do we always focus in on that bit? Um, I, I didn't see it as anti-Semitic at all, possibly badly worded. Um, but, you, you know, you've got somebody or other, 
Peter Coyne is or somebody Coyne who's standing as a Labour candidate in um, Bermondsey, who's had all sorts of uh, uh, um, terrible behaviour proven. And he's sort of other people just can say, oh, I'm so sorry. And they go dealt with. And Diane was kept with. Well, I didn't need to tell you, but I yeah. think we really need to make something whether she chooses to stand or not, whether she can or can't be the candidate. The double standards and the hypocrisy does hit people. And so, you know, you've had people, you know, I know my own constituency of Hastings and Rye, we have a Starmer supporting candidate and people who would probably agree with her politics were shocked at the appalling process of selecting her a couple of years back when people even mildly to the left were not even allowed onto the long list. So um, even, you know, right wingers, if you like, wrote in, in her. So really that the idea that we could have any democracy in the Labour Party is so, or justice or even commitment to justice is, is just gone so far beyond. And I mean, even the mainstream media are picking up because it's so extreme that everyone can see it. And we need to make a lot of that. But, you know, obviously, as far as Diane's good, willing to be that person for us. Sorry, I've ranted a bit, but it's okay. it's not that. Thank, thank, thank you, Leah. Really angry, but... And I guess I can hear you out. David next, and then Dean, and then Laura. I'll ask you to maybe give us another perspective on what's happening in the elections, and then we go to Frank, whose hand just appeared. So, David. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thanks, Luke. Then... Yeah. Well, total to su support to Diane, wh wh whatever she chooses. Um, uh, I was very interested in Comrade Malik's um, uh, comments. I think it's fantastic that the black members of the RNT have taken this decision uh, and then to put it forward to the to the RNT <clears throat> because this IHRA, I won't, it's, it's been said just by the previous speaker, it's, it's a ludicrous definition um, and it's, it's basically a, a, a Zionist weapon. Um, Coming on, yeah, the, the spurious anti-Semitism that Labour used, first of all, to get, you know, to, to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn. And I believe they did it before the media, in actual fact. It, that came from within the Parliamentary Labour Party way back. They couldn't find anything else on Jeremy. So they used anti-Semitism, spurious allegations of anti-Semitism that they've continued to do. That's been mentioned by several people. Not only have they done that, They've used it, as have the Tories and the media, uh, against the hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people who regularly demonstrate for Palestine and against a genocide in Gaza. Um, so there, there's, all, uh, there's all of that as well. Uh, a couple of other things, if you'd allow me. I do hope that Faiza at least takes legal action. I saw an interview with her where she said she's contemplating it this uh, because I believe rules rules of, have obviously been bent in the Labour Party. Two more things very quickly. Um, I mean, Nadine mentioned uh, the campaign for Jeremy and uh, there's a, a, a well-known activist in the Clapham Common area, Jan O'Malley, who told me the other day in Sainsbury's, I'm going to Islington to campaign for Jeremy and I've just left the Labour Party. Uh, and one, if you live in South East London, comrades, the Communist Party have a very fine candidate, Ollie Snelling, standing in Lewisham North. The Communist Party have just one candidate in London. <clears throat> and the line of the Communist Party is basically, they will not be yeah. supporting the voting for... Thanks, 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 David. Um... Um, Laura's going to give us a little oh, report sorry. back on what's I, I, happening I've intruded, in that party, sorry. so I don't want you to steal her thunder. <laughs> so, uh, apologies, Laura. <laughs> you can do it better so. than me. <laughs> so, thank you there. Um, we go to Nadine now, and then we go into Laura. Can I, can I just quickly Frank. say, um, I'm going to have to go because some of our canvases for Jeremy have come back and I need to debrief them. But um, I'm going to get Sonny from Hackney North, who's in the left, to talk to Luke or Steve, because I can give you up-to-date information about Diane. Is that a good thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I don't... Um, no, I... Okay, happy trails out there. Sorry, I can't. 
Okay. Sorry Bye. I can't be with you for this afternoon, but um, next time around. Okay. okay. Um, who we got next? Laura. There, there, there's, of course, we didn't even mention the Ford report, which wasn't acted upon in the Labour Party as regards racism in the party. We mustn't forget that that document is still needs some action. But, um, yes, the, this, you know, the elections is being dominated, of course, by um, the Labour Party and what they've done and um, and the Conservatives, but there's other parties running and Laura will tell you about a favourite yes. party. Laura. Ben has had his hand up for a long time. I don't know what Who has? he powered. I don't know if he uh, say something. All right. I, 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 I saw his hand after I mentioned um, that you would be speaking. So Stephen, his hand is still up. So he'll speak after you. And then Frank. Thanks. Well, I, okay. Well, Frank, your hand is down. Okay. Laura, if you want to tell us what's happening with... Okay. Um, well, in case anybody didn't know, not that it's a secret, um, I'm a member of the Communist Party. I have been a member of the Communist Party since I was born, since both my grandparents and my parents were members. And um, I used to play on the floor with, with leaflets. I grew up looking at them. Um, so I've been a member on, on two, um, two continents, um, but I'm here now. And for my sins, which must have been many in a previous life, I was put on the Elections Commission, which means that I go to meetings every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock to talk to all the candidates about what they're doing, how well they're doing. And since uh, the party is national, the candidates come from all over the place. Um, I will say one thing with respect to what was uh, to what David said. Uh, there are two candidates at the moment who are not party members, who uh, the, the party is supporting. One is Jeremy, and one is a woman named Claudia Webb, who uh, now I have forgotten where she's from. Lester, Lester yeah. East, I think. She used to be um, in London, and a lot of people know her. Um, if in your area there there is a a good left winger that you think the party might uh, support, and if there is no, if there isn't a party member standing, and there aren't very many standing, I have to say, um, then the thing to do is to ask your local to ask the executive committee, and but it has to be done quickly because all names have to be in by I think it's next Friday, um, and they will they will look at the background and uh, and tell us. But so far, those are the only two we know about. So, if party members want to campaign for Jeremy or speak on behalf of Jeremy, that's or Claudia, that's absolutely fine. Um, but we are a centralized party, so decisions are made at the top, uh, generally speaking. There are about, I mean, we had 22 people at the meeting this morning, most of whom were candidates. Um, we've got candidates in, well, we've got, I think, four in London, um, a couple in Leicester. Uh, there's several in the Northwest. There's at least one in in Croydon, not in Croydon, in Cornwall, in Taunton, and uh, I don't know if that's anywhere near Drax's, but um, who's ever in, involved with Cody? I, side of London, you know, the world is a bit of a blur, so um, I don't, I don't actually know. Um, and there are a lot of people. I mean. Um, it is absolutely the case that standing a candidate is a very difficult uh, endeavor. And one of the major things I discovered today that I didn't know was that the post office will deliver leaflets, but they have the, um, they can refuse to deliver them on religious or, uh, or political grounds. And one of our members who was a postie, I think he still is, uh, at the, I think the last election, he was asked to deliver 
um, leaflets for the National Front, and he refused. He said, I'm simply not doing it. And there was literally nothing they could do. And the post office also if, um, has the last say in any leaflets that go out. If they don't like what's in your leaflet, they can refuse to, to deliver it. They can refuse to send it out. Um, don't ask me, I don't make the law. Um, I mean, there are, the places where people are standing for the party are, you know, some of them, there's one where they need 60,000 leaflets, all of which are going to be delivered by the post office. And there's another one where they have a much smaller uh, constituency where they're delivering them themselves. And it, basically, you may, I mean, many people may not even see a candidate from the Communist Party, because as I say, there aren't that many of them. Our idea, or the party's idea, basically every time there is, um, there is an election, is to get out the ideas of the party and make people aware that the party exists and what we stand for. There is a manifesto that's going out in two forms, one form for candidates and one form for places where there are no candidates, but we would like people to know that we're running. And the, the manifesto gives, a, I think, a 10-point plan on what we actually stand for. I haven't seen it yet, but, you know, it was a snap election. So we're, we're sort of writing as we're running, peddling, you know, we're a bit like a duck, right? We look calm and serene on the top and we're peddling like hell underneath. Um, I am not a candidate, I'm pleased to say. I have no intention of being a candidate. Um, there is no one, I mean, I live in East Finchley. As far as I know, nobody's running in East Finchley. Uh, I do a lot of the secretarial work and a lot of the paperwork, and uh, I help people whenever they can. But uh, basically, it is, without putting too fine a point on it, it's a bit of a thankless task. And I understand that also from um, the experience I watched my whole family have. I mean, you know, my father was a state organizer for a party that was sort of run by the Communist Party in Illinois. And he went to meetings all the time. And I'm going to meetings all the time, even though I'm not a candidate and never will be. I haven't got the stamina. I'm too old, so I'm not doing it. But I will support them. And I did, some people may have, in London, may have realized that my name was on the Greater London Assembly um, list for the Communist Party. And uh, it was funny, I was, I was outed by some of my to some of my friends who didn't know I was in the Communist Party. But when I was asked to put my name on it, I said, I will do it for, for uh, under two, um, I will do it uh, as long as I can be promised that two things will happen. One, I will never win. And two, I don't have to do any door to door because I'm partially disabled, so I can't walk too far. I was absolutely okay. sure both of those would come true. Sure enough, we did not win, and I didn't have to, have to do any door-to-door. -door. Now, these candidates are going to be doing a lot of door-to-door -door work. And in fact, a couple of them have decided they're going to be very public in the small area that they live in, so that everybody knows now that they're members of the Communist Party. Other people in larger areas, like Leicester, like um, well, areas in London, even like Taunton, are being, you know, they, they're doing more social media. So it's completely individual what people in the party are doing. Everybody knows they're not going to win, but the idea is that we let people know what the party stands for, why we're running, even though we know we're not going to win, although we don't say that too loudly, um, and what we can do to help people in the area if, if necessary. Now, I get week to week, sometimes day to day information about our party, which is 
obviously an independent party. So if there are any specific questions that you want any answers to, I can help. Um, I will say though that working with the post office depends on where you happen to be. Some of the people in the Northwest are saying that the post office is refusing to make appointments with them, which is interesting because legally they're supposed to. But um, it, well, that will be sorted out. So, I mean, if if you if there's if you're not sure who else to ask a question, you can always ask me, and I will always find out for you. And that's the yeah. end of my talk. Thank, Thank you so much, Laura. Um, you you got to be careful of your 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 conditions that you set in because from a report I got recently, you had ten thousand votes in the, the in in the added local elections so be careful you know you might you might get elected um I, I, but also to, I don't to, think to also so. to <laughs> also to let you know that I did hand out some of the the their flyers at angel station um during that during that period so thank you I don't see a hand up for a question um Stephen, your hand was up before. I, I'm not sure, Stephen Howard. I'm not sure. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, yeah, sure. Come in. Communist party members, apart from at this point, Jeremy and Claudia and anybody else who's agreed by the party, and I'll let Luke know, and he can sort of send out for, depending on who is where, if other people are agreed. Communist party members are not allowed to uh, canvas for or speak for or sign the nomination sheets for anybody else, except the people who are agreed. Great, thank you. Okay. Thanks. thanks yes, thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Stephen Howard here. Uh, one, Israel is on the African continent. Second thing, Arabs and Muslims are Semites, the largest Jewish population are Africans. So this Zionist ploy to identify solely Zionists as Semites, that could be defeated with, uh, just by presenting the facts. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank, thanks for the info. I don't know if anybody else want to comment, comment anywhere. Um, Ozzy. Um, I, I see your, okay, you want to come back, Laura, please. Yeah, I just want to say something not about England. Um, I used to live in Mexico many years ago. Oh, yeah, I used to live in Mexico many years ago. And um, my family is culturally Jewish. I mean, obviously, being communist, we're not terribly religious um, and never have been. But it was interesting to me when I lived in Mexico that the Jewish community and the Catholic community were very integrated. There was never a problem that I saw when I was there. And I just recognize, and I want everybody else to recognize that one of the candidates for the presidency is a good Jewish Mexican girl. Um, I've forgotten her name, the one beginning with S. Uh, most of the Jewish community in Mexico is from, uh, uh, from Egypt, and around there and came over after World War I. So her generation, that is my generation, would be pretty much the third generation immigrant into Mexico. And I think it's really interesting that with a small Jewish population, there are only three generations there, there's somebody who looks like may very well be elected um, to the presidency, although, there are a lot of people who are not happy about her because they think she is simply a mouthpiece for the for the the president, the outgoing president. So, okay. um, I I know the the women are certainly excited by her candidacy, and and she's they they've been out on the streets demonstrating and so on against violence against women and girls. So they're excitedly looking forward to uh, it's Claudia, Shane Bond, I think. Shame bomb. Yes, thank you. Okay, I've got um, I've got um, 
Fabina, and then I'll see if you can give us a little report back on anything that's happening down there in the Caribbean, Trinidad, um, around this American basis or around elections. Um, so, Fabina, you had yes, um, Fabina? You, you mentioned yeah. earlier the role played by uh, uh, the United States of America in protecting the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, this doctrine is one that Morris Bishop railed against, where he invoked the ire of the United States. Nobody's backyard. No, no one is in anybody's backyard. What the hell? Um, the invasion of Grenada was to put the Caribbean, uh, these countries which were immensely wealthy for the uh, capitalist enterprise of Britain that were powered by the free labor of kidnapped Africans, put them back in their box. Um, our role, uh, Luke, is to be playgrounds for the wealthy. Our role is to be sunshine beaches and rum and pina colada. That's what our role is. Not to say that our people are poor and should have a right to determine what their issues are. So when in 1982, as I learned a few days ago, uh, the United States spoke to the Eastern Caribbean states in a secret meeting in Barbados to establish what's called the Regional Security System, the RSS. This was a year before the American invasion of Grenada. And it subsequently uh, seems to be that those countries that sent token forces with the Americans, Barbados, um, Jamaica, and so on, they sent in a few, a few troops to come in well after the Americans came in. And of course, the Americans got a bit of a pasting from the Grenadians, um, none of whom deserted the army. None of whom deserted the army. Um, they came in, and so it was a multinational force. And the purpose of that meeting in 82 was to develop and coordinate joint efforts amongst member states for the security needs of its common domestic space, if requested. However, since then, the American Central Southcom, South Southern Command, have been engaging in annual exercises uh, called trade winds. And it was reported in Internationalist 360 that the chief of staff of the Barbados Defense Force, Commodore Errington Sherland, declared that the focus of this year is on foreign military interaction, maritime operations, ground security, and field training exercises supporting Southcom's campaign plan. And I say, what the hell? If you're supposed How come you're now an adjunct of Southcom's uh, security system? So therefore, you're part of the United States uh, Department of Defense's um, assets. Nothing to do with protecting uh, the people of the Caribbean. And what is the purpose of this force? This force is paid for by the taxes of Grenadians and other Caribbean people. So we're paying, or the people in the Caribbean are paying, for them to have a force that will dominate them if they get very uppity. Isn't this, isn't this really funny? And I'm saying that the uh, it says that the people of Grenada and the Caribbean reject the role of Massa's army. Currently, they have it. And the intention is that should a Grenada occur somewhere else, then these forces will be used, rather like the old West India Regiment during the labor turmoils of the 1930s and, and 40s to zip from island to island to keep things there. That is clearly what this force is. And you alluded to it, and I um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to yes, expand yes. on it. Thanks. Yes, but clearly there's more to be said on that. And we need to make that a meeting at some point because it is really important for the region and for the left in particular, who might have a different view as to how we want to see our communities develop. All right, thank, thanks for that. Um, now I shall ask Ozzy to give us a little. Ozzy, how are you doing? Come in. Take the hey. floor. Yeah, th thanks a lot, Luke. Actually, I was just prepared to take in and enjoy the discussions. I thought that it was quite rich uh, this this well, this morning. 
for me this afternoon for you guys, but I, I really, really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it because when I when I saw the topic, I was just kind of reflecting. I'll be really quick, Luke. You know, one of the things we are we have to we are navigating through liberal bourgeois elections. That's what we're doing, navigating. And I listening this morning, this afternoon, I think uh, the tactics and strategies that we have employed in navigating that landscape, um, I think is very welcomed. Um, I'm particularly, you know, happy with the work that Nadine and they are doing. Um, I was particularly pleased with the report on the RMT's decision. And I was happy to even hear that the Communist Party is still in the free, as small as it is, but still trying to make its mark. And I think all of these things are important as we navigate, uh, you know, bourgeois elections. And it's it kind of crucial. These all these elections are crucial because of the context in which they are happening. It's in the context of deep, deep, deep global cap uh, crisis of of global capital, and. You feel that, and you, that was manifested completely in the South African elections, um, and the, the even though they still won, but that was a devastating defeat. To go from fifty-seven percent to forty, that was a, def a in my view, a defeat. And um, so that kind of dovetail into the last point um, that was being made about U.S. hegemony and the use of imperial military power in the West Indies, in the Caribbean. And that will become more tense because of the crisis, you see. It is not just happening um, in the context of that global capital is doing well and, you know, there's all of this growth and there's no impact on the environment and we are all going to be living very nicely with nature. That's not the reality. The reality is that global capital is in crisis, manifesting itself in, of course, wars, um, deepen uh, rise in right-wing fascism um, and the ecological crisis. And therefore, the, I, the fear for Caribbean territories is the further deepening and expansion of U.S. hegemony within the region. They have kind of taken the eye, they have taken their eyes off the Caribbean for some years now, focusing on other regions because they thought that, well, I think the, the Caribbean is sufficiently Americanized. So we can kind of not focus on them too much, hardly likely anything on towards like uh, Grenada Revolution will take place. But things began to change geopolitically with, of course, the rise of the left in Latin America. And, and then with that, with the neighboring um, situation in Venezuela. And what we will see in the coming weeks, and I say weeks, not even months, really will come out of the Venezuelan elections, which is supposed to be at the end of July, because of course, the results are going to be challenged. They're going to say that it was uh, it was fraud. They're going to, the opposition are going to have huge, um, uh, uh, protest and so on, and which will create more the pretext for some type of intervention of which the Caribbean would be asked to support. So, I mean, we are living in a very interesting times in terms of elections in the Caribbean. We have three key ones next four, four next year in 2025, Guyana. And I say that coming out off of what I just spoke about in terms of the current Guyanese government um, and their relationship with the multinationals. And then we have Jamaica, which will be in 2025, um, and then Trinidad and Tobago in 2025, and St. Vincent in 2025. I mean, my concern with all, I mean, the elections is one thing, you know, but the question is, what is the nature of the political ideology that is emerging in the Caribbean? Right, we would have been quite a um, a, a fertile ground for alternative radical ideologies. All right, that challenged capital, challenged U.S. hegemony, and I think the comrade made a real good point about the position of Maurice Bishop. I don't see any Caribbean leader making such a statement now, in the face of this growing hegemony. Maybe some say me a motley. Not too sure. Not too sure. But um, so. Next year will be a very interesting year, but but what we could look out for, just as there was a snap elections called in the UK, because remember I said the context, the crisis, the global crisis we had. 
I would not be surprised if in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, they call it a snap election or an early election. And I would not be surprised, therefore, if we end up with all these elections that are carded for 2025 happening much earlier in order to what I I what I view as consolidating a political support for the expansion and intervention of U.S. hegemony. So I'll leave it there. Luke, I think I've spoken long enough. As I said, I just wanted yes, to yes. <laughs> enjoy the conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very, very good, um, Ozzy. Thanks very much for that. I think you mentioned Guyana there, and um, Fabina has promised to send me some information, which I hope he'll circulate with the executive about the Guyana situation, uh, about them recently declaring that they, they'll be changing the constitution, which actually describes Guyana as a kind of Marxist, Leninist, um, that uh, that we meant that that is mentioned in the constitution. They will be taking that out. They've got better. They've got friends now that I guess don't like that kind of language. Yes, um, I heard. I, I heard think, about that. Yeah. What 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 I what I. You know, I would like to think for the Caribbean, and as you said, you know, we have such potential ready for, but for change. And Grenada certainly delivered for the short time that um, you know they had the revolution. Um, we've got to find a way of actually fighting imperialism. I think, and one of the ways I see that is the whole fight for reparations um, for African enslavement, because you know that would involve the raising awareness of the masses is a, is a great area to really raise politics and politicize about the imperialism of what's going on in that history. And it's something that should be ripe for the masses. And I think, you know, we really got to be doing the work on the ground. I, I mentioned at one meeting on reparations that the way we are approaching it here in the UK is to really work with the trade unions, work with black and white, with the working class, raising these issues. And I think in the Caribbean, you know, the ground has got to be ready for that. You know, people are still living in situations in many cases where they're still in abject poverty, lack of education, health, and all kinds of issues. We're dealing with violence, you know, the legacy of slavery. You know, you down in the Caribbean, we need to be on the ground some more with the masses, raising the um awareness about what has gone on before about our history we don't know it so many people don't know it they're trying to cut out teaching of history we've talked about possibly a conference in the caribbean at some time um to look at reparations and other things so actually we need to be in touch and see how we will get support from the trade unions to make something happen we'll discuss that the executives so people are listening in i got two hands on up i'll go for joseph first and then um, Stephen afterwards, and then Ola. It's in that order I'm seeing them. So, Joseph, come in. Yeah, good. You take the good floor. Evening. Yeah, good evening, everyone, um, comrades. Um, in terms of the Caribbean, I think we need to pay attention to what is happening um, in a soft way. For instance, the return of US, USAID in a big way along with the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, uh, all of these institutions are coming in. Also Canada, uh, Canada Fund and so on, and they are pushing agendas that are going to support any return of large-scale um, economic uh, rule of you. And also, uh, the fact that uh, they are trying to make issue over China's uh, China's role in the Caribbean, like uh, recently, there's this big thing about China uh, uh, project um, about they're going to have their own airport and all that kind of stuff. I, these are things I think we as progressive, if I should say the word, should be aware of, but also. The fact that this year has been projected to be the worst, I mean, one of the most intense hurricane season we will experience. It is quite possible, and a lot of people are already frightened that, for instance, Grenada could end up like how it was in 2004, and then requiring handouts uh, from Uncle Sam and others, and um, 
people are fighting that there's not an appetite for uh, assisting countries to restore, to restore themselves. So advantage could be taken of, of us. And finally, we need to have a conversation on how can we reconcile countries in the Caribbean wanting to go into explore, exploration and exploitation of fossil fuel when that is one of the main contributors of the continuing um, uh, severe weather, severe climatic change. So it, 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 it's a lot, of comp a lot of people, in talking to people across the Caribbean, a lot of them feel paralyzed. I don't know if Ossie would share the same thing. I mean, ordinary people I, I'm talking about now. Uh, but there is hope. I think one of the avenues we can use is the whole issue of Pan-African, Pan-Africanism to really revive the spirit of our people. I mean, we cannot forget Haiti also. Cannot forget Haiti. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Joseph. I think um, definitely um, the environment is going to be our next um, Zoom meeting. We'll have speakers from the Caribbean, from Africa, and from the UK. So we'll be tackling some of those issues. Um, and I agree with you, you know, we got to be watching the US and the plans for the Caribbean. We've got to think smarter than them and move faster than them to actually try and upset some of those plans. Um, and we will we'll engage with those issues as at our executive meeting. We definitely will put that on our agenda. That's things to discuss. What are our next steps in the Caribbean? How we can support the movement to really combat imperialism? Um, and, and it's a real challenge. Um, as so many of the, the leaders are compromised and not really representing the masses. So we got work to do. Thank you for that. I'm Stephen, and then Ola. Yes, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, I must uh, respectfully disagree with uh, Ozzy on early elections being called, uh, Mr. Warwick, uh, on early elections being called in Sweet TNT. Now, for the past six, maybe more years, the UNC has been calling for early elections after losing what one was 10 years ago and uh, that has not transpired uh dr rowley is not interested in any early elections because the elections are not his main concern it's just uh, serving the people of sweet tnt so uh, even though the unc will continually call for early elections i do not see that happening at least in Trinidad and tobago when we look at uh, what china is doing they have a, a financial colonization program going on in both Africa and the Caribbean. They've invested, they're invest, investing a lot of money. There are at least five nations that uh, China is uh, doing business with in the Caribbean, starting from Guyana, going all the way up to Cuba. Uh, they are building a port, I think it's in Labre, in Trinidad and Tobago. They've also built uh, one of the longest highways in Jamaica. And they've even, uh, I think they have a, a 25 year contract to control the port in Jamaica. I'm not too sure of the length of time, but uh, I think uh, the Bahamas has also uh, uh, signed some contracts with, uh, with the Chinese. So I think the Americans, now, if I know this, you know, the American government is fully aware of what's going on. And they are seeing China's presence in uh, Africa and Trinidad and Tobago on a financial basis, not dropping bombs, not coming in and with, with you know, with uh, religious people trying to make that kind of change, but putting in, putting, uh, making investments in that, you know, these nations may not always be able to repay and therefore taking control of those resources gives them a foothold in uh, both Africa and the Caribbean. And since uh, now it appears that China, uh, China in order to uh, repopulate based on their overpopulation, they're now having their people go to uh, the continent and the Caribbean 
to basically uh, marry or have offspring with African and Caribbean people who will then become citizens, giving them, giving them a stronger foothold on the continent and in, in the Caribbean. So we need to take things like that into consideration. And with Trinidad and Tobago, just, uh, you know, which was once connected to Venezuela, and uh, Kamlet Pesad Bissessa wrote a letter to then President Trump asking him to put an embargo on uh, Trinidad and Tobago because of the relationship that they've established with Venezuela, especially as it comes to gas. She was at, actually calling for the, uh, for America to put an embargo on, on uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, fortunately, uh, President then President Trump did nothing about it. But a relationship has been built between uh, the PNM government and the U.S. government to strengthen relations between the two nations. And we need to take stuff like that into consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thanks, Stephen. There's a lot of, um, I see some hands going up, and I think there's a lot of controversy over the road and belt initiative that the Chinese have taken, not only in the Caribbean, but all over the world in Africa as you mentioned, um, and those countries have certainly benefited it, benefit in, in some ways, because when you think of imperialism, 100 years in Africa, not even building a road that, or making any links with train to connect the African continent, at least the Chinese are starting to make some moves in that direction. Um, Certainly in the Caribbean, there's hardly been any kind of development uh, monies that comes into our region from the U.S. or from Britain or from anywhere for that matter. Um, now that I see the Chinese are taking initiatives, I think they're certainly starting to pay more attention and look up to what's happening. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the Chinese are, 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 they are not there to be a, a socialist intervention, as it were, in the region. You know, they're very much capitalist-minded, and of course, they're looking to make returns on the money. But I doubt whether the conditions they're attaching are any worse than we will get from America or from the imperialist countries. I think it's good that we're in a kind of competition of what's happening down there. Um, but I wouldn't be. I, I, I am more wary of American imperialism and the connections that I would be of the influence of the Chinese in the region and whatever it is they bring into that region. I'm sure people would have other opinions about it. We've got Ola's hand up at yeah. the moment, Ola. Well, I've I've spoken on three, two different occasions, so I won't take long. But just to, to add, I'm, I'm glad that the conversation has gone in this way in the last um, in the last few minutes. Um, basically, the PASCFs, um, next um, event um, is a the 15th annual Marcus Garvey Memorial Lecture, which will um, be um, uh, addressed by um, Kane Day Andrews from Birmingham. And, um, you know, it's interesting. What, what, what I was asked, why would you do a Garvey event or, or something of that nature? And it really dovetails with where this discussion has gone, you know, and we really have to have our own and all people understanding um, um, self-determination and determining their own agenda. And um, what was interesting, an interesting quote three years before Garvey um, died from Churchill, and I, and I, and I put it, because it, it, it really is what we need to be hearing and, and understanding. And Churchill says at the Peel Commission, which is, again, interesting because we're talking about Gaza. But Churchill says, you know, um, I do not agree that the dog in the manger has the final right to the manger, even though he may have lain there for a very long time. I do not admit that right. I do not admit admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the Black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly race, to put it that way, 
has come in and taken their place. Yeah. Now, you know, it's for us to understand that this is not just an isolated person talk. It, it was, you know, and has been basically something that we have to live up and deal with, not just then, but now, you know, so, you know, that's, I, I, I've sent you a, a personal um, note, um, Luke. I'd like to put the event that we're doing on, on there, but I'd like to ask your permission to do that rather than just put it up in case people are interested. Um, yeah, yeah, no, please put it up. I, you know, okay. Andrew, he's a good, good guy, I think, so to just, just post it Thank as you. information. People can make up their mind. So thanks very much for that. I've got um, Fabina's hand up, and um, it gives us a few minutes to be closing up the meeting. So I think this might be the last contribution in some way. So come on in, Fabina. You got Luke, Frank. I, okay, um, Luke. Frank. Yeah, Frank hand yeah. is also up, but I think it's it's blending with his background. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Can I can I beg you to? Uh, I've got a I've got yes. a call, so I have to leave. Can I just beg you to say? I think this would be a very interesting meeting because there is a lot of discussion within the Caribbean community here. We cannot uh, determine what the Caribbean governments do, but we can have a commentary on it. I think because I've spoken to like um, like Ola, um, that is my call. I have to attend. Uh, the Chinese okay. are not doing this because they're running an international charity. They're doing it for China. And we must appreciate that. Let us not be foolish. So let's have a debate and decide what our position is going to be. If we need development, we may need to raise money or resources from other countries. Let us have a debate and see how this goes. Thank you very much, comrade. Sorry to yeah. rush yeah, to yeah. speak and if, flee. If I, yes, if I can just add before you, you run, because I think there's also not a, a problem of um of of people, because I think lately they're saying the demographics are changing. They're worried about population fall rather than population rise. I don't think the Chinese are trying to export the population, as it were. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's, thank you for that. You see, um, Frank. I've had quite a few things to say, but every time my hands, I've even changed the color of my hands to get, yeah, that, to get a chance, I'm but sorry. you know. <laughs> I, I, just, um, I just didn't notice it, Frank. Come on, yeah. come on in. Our, our thing is like this, first of all, on the trade union thing, because we have, I haven't finished off that. I say on the anti, um, on the trade union thing, we seem to be like a dog with a bone. And we they show in the bone and we follow in because we followed them when it was the trade union. Last year it was trade unions and um they was they were expelling people or disciplining people for going to trade union um, to picket going on the picket lines, you know. And this year it's anti Semitism. You know, and, and they keep changing, like the, the Ford report, we've heard nothing about that. Um, that's been up for uh, two years now, and it's been ducked under the thing. Then we've got the wind rush. There's, you know, and I'm in, in, in 2010, when the trade unions got together, a few of them got together and started Tusk because they realized that the, the, um, Labour Party is spoiled and it's not going to be, it's not going to be changed. Then, uh, Jeremy got in, we thought, oh, well, look, it might change. But then we saw it's not the people that got rid of Jeremy, it's the executive who's got rid of uh, Jeremy. And it's the executive that we've got to start going at if you want the, this Labour Party to return to something else. But we say, forget that, let's start another thing. Let's start building. From 2010, we've been building another party, right? Now, over the years, we've noticed that when there's something bad that they want to put, to the, when the conservatives want to push in or get uh, something bad done, they lose the election and Labour goes in and Labour ends up doing what the conservative wanted to do. Now, there was a throwaway thing that's happened uh, that uh, Rishi Sunak said, talked about, which is about the conscription of our youngsters getting back national service. Now, from what Ozzy had said, from what everyone's been saying about this, they're building new camps, right? We talk about the Chinese. 
they're building camps to counter what the Chinese are doing and, and Russians doing. And there's only one way they can do that. And that is to become more physical. They need soldiers over here. So let labor go in, let labor start the conscription. You know, there is, <laughs> it might sound a bit yeah, yeah. ancient, but to me, that is what's, what's, what's starting to happen now. They're starting to make the camps. You're either for us or against us. And this is this is I think where the world is heading. Yes, China, China is investing a lot in the Caribbean and in Africa because Africa is sustaining capitalism and imperialism. So you've got to get a foothold in those countries to make sure that you know that you you cut that off. That was my doorbell. I'll be back quickly. Yeah, you've got to make sure you cut off the head of the snake, and this is what's been going on. Read any of the the literature; they talk about the head of the snake. They're cutting off the head of the snake because without, without cutting off the head of the snake, you you know, China has to move from one stage yeah. to the next stage. To us, they've got to move to communism yeah. because they're, they're yeah. socialists at the present. So to move to that next stage, they've got to prepare the way. And the only way they can do that is by yeah. making sure that the Caribbean, Africa, and all the people that are sustaining imperialism, you know, develop. Yeah. and start okay. developing themselves. And basically, I don't see how people can't see this. People talk about uh, exporting their people so that they can go and, you know, uh, oh, gosh, come on, <laughs> you know. Uh, all right. yes, uh, th th thank you very much, Frank. I think... You know, off, he, he, did, he mentioned some of, the, some of the developments that has happened in the country made by China. Why didn't the US, why didn't Britain, why didn't they do that? Right. China's done it, and they've yep. made it made it uh, uh, financially viable for the countries that they've done it for. You know, please put yeah. some thought behind what you're thinking, and stop thinking about the the crazy things that they they're trying to push into your head. Well, Thank okay, you. friend. Thanks, thanks a lot. Because of time, um, clearly one of the things that's happening in the world is arms spending is rocketing out, breaking all records. America, mm -hmm. Britain. Europe, everybody's spending more and more on arms. They need they need to do something. Except with those China arms, and Russia. Exactly. And the, the amount of bases all over the world that they that they have they're they putting down. And um and all and and organizations they form it, more new ones, NATO and Pacific this and that and the rest. Okay. I think it's been a a, a, a great meeting. We, we sorry, sorry, Stephen. I know you want to come back, but we we got to close. We've gone past the the two hour time. Uh, yeah, I know, Mr. Chair. I minutes. was just trying to make one quick point. I am. I was pointing yeah, out quick. that with the Chinese going in to to the the Caribbean and Africa, and having their offsprings born there, they then become citizens, meaning to say that they now have political clout in yeah. these in these places. Not that they were trying to, to transport your people to these different regions. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, we, for that clarification, um, wow, it's been, a, for me, a, a rich meeting in terms of hearing from so many people, hearing so many voices, the contributions. Um, it's opened up the door for so many other issues we need to be dealing with. Um, and they're coming up rapidly, wind rush. Um, we also need to, the environment urgently. We also need to be thinking about um, all this arms spending and what, what it means for us. Um, and in the UK, where our elections are going and so on. Um, I need to remind people we're not a funded organization. We encourage people to join us. We thrive on membership fees and affiliation fees. So if you haven't joined CLS, I think it's easier now to get onto the website and join us so please if you haven't um and thank you the meetings would not happen without you coming to the meeting and contributing and we look forward to seeing you at the next sunday meeting in july is it yes july's meeting first sunday of the month um okay have a good election wherever you are it's happening all over <laughs> so bye for now Thank you. Bye, everyone. Steve, you're on. Are you going to lunch? Okay. That is up.
No, I'm still here. I just put up. You can oh, find, you're still there. <laughs> you okay. can find it on the website. Thank you want to join Caribbean Labour Solidarity, it's dead easy. Go to the website and you can join. You can even use the wretched PayPal to uh, to do it easily. So we welcome... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we welcome everybody. Right. Uh, there you go. That's how you find it. Okay. Thank, thanks. Thanks very much for keeping things updated, there, Steve. Okay, guys. Executive meeting second Tuesday as usual, and we get to discuss some of the issues here. Okay. Bye now. Be. Thanks, Lucia. Or is it Ken? I can and Anne. Thank you, Annette. Relax, Mia. Frank. Yes, sir. Uh, David Lammy. <laughs> it's joke time now, is it? <laughs> well, we still we still got a few people to, to leave yet, Steve. Just wondered where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to be careful. Oh, sorry. I'll stop. I'll tell you what I'll do. I will stop the recording so that people yeah. can. Uh, uh,